Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, we have a really interesting episode. We're calling this Military Fi 201. This is essentially for the many members of our community. And last time we did a survey of somewhere between 10 and 15% of the financial independence community is either current military or former. And I suspect when we take family members into account, it swells to significantly more than that. So we are trying to make a series of episodes about military fi. And I think this one in particular is going to be especially meaningful. So this is for essentially people approaching military retirement, people who have made the decision, I'm going to stick this out and they are going to get a military retirement. What are the considerations? What's everything they need to consider from A to Z? And we have someone on the podcast to help us with this, who is just an absolute expert. Daniel Kopp is a fee-only fiduciary financial planner, CFP, and the founder of Wise Stewardship Financial Planning, where he helps young widows and widowers, as well as service members, get their financial lives in order by aligning their money with their values. And our good friend, Military Dollar, introduced me to Daniel and said he is the perfect person to help with this. And I think this is going to be really impactful. So with that, welcome to Choose FI. Daniel, my friend, thank you for joining me. This is going to be fun. Oh, I'm so excited, Brad. As a person who's been a part of, feel like, like this Choose FI family for a long time, it's really full circle to come and be a guest on the podcast when I was one not that long ago, back in the early days of the show, someone who was trying to figure out my own path, ultimately led me to a career in financial planning. So it's been a part of that journey. Oh, that's incredible. I did not know that. That is really, really cool. It's amazing how long we've been doing this. It's now <laughs> seven and a half years, which is just absolutely wild. So yeah, I'm glad it could help. And one thing I forgot to mention, certainly on the uh, the introduction was you were a nine years active duty officer in the Air Force. That's right. So obviously you have significant background in the military, which probably uh, goes without saying, but I did want to explicitly state it. Yeah, that translates well into understanding the acronym ease and, you know, speaking the same language, understanding the assumptions that come into so many aspects of the FI journey and, and financial planning as related to that. Yeah. And there certainly are a lot of them. So let's dive into this. You sent me one of the most incredible outlines I've ever seen. And I think what's cool about this is you can essentially run with this. I'm going to steward the conversation and kind of ask questions and ask for clarification here or there. But I mean, honestly, this is just a bullet point masterclass on what you need to consider as you approach your military retirement. So yeah, where do we start? Well, the beautiful thing about military financial planning and its approach to FI is, you know, there are a lot of benefits to a military career that don't exist much else in the, uh, you know, kind of American financial services, financial planning landscape. That's no surprise probably to the majority of your listeners who are somewhat familiar with that. But especially for those that might be listening and thinking this, well, I'm not military. How does this apply to me? There will be some parallel principles whenever we're talking about some of the pension planning aspects or just understanding some of the things related to taxes and insurance and protecting your maybe non-financial spouse. I'm guessing for a lot of people here, we're really talking about like not just building the financial plan for you, but for those who are married or partnered, incorporating everything that goes in there. So the beauty of military financial planning is that that pension, right? Almost nothing like it, that golden egg, golden goose scenario, where when you look and map that out, right, you have this guaranteed, well, so long as the government is in existence, taxing <laughs> and paying, right, that has the ability to have the inflation adjustments on there. So one of my fellow financial planner friends called this, you know, this idea of a minimum dignity floor, where no matter what happens, right, with your investment portfolio or other factors in life, right, you have this guaranteed stream of income that will last the rest of your life. That's the contract that was made between the American people and the people who give their lives in service to their country, right? So that's that bond equivalent. So whenever we're starting to this, right, you build that post financial independence budget, right, you will know that this is the minimum level that's going to come in. So that frees up a lot of different things. So one of the first things that does oftentimes is recognizing that it is still an all or nothing scenario. So it's a cliff vest scenario, right? You get to the 20 years or you don't. So when the DOD was rolling out the blended retirement system a couple of years ago, which is now 
without going into all the details, basically offered a TSP match where there used to be one, but reduced the pension multiplier. So a lot of people prior to that, it was only roughly 20%, one in five service members actually got to that full active duty pension. So we're talking about a minority within the American populace and then a minority of right. those who are actually served or are actually getting there, right? So this is something that sets them up for success in a lot of other areas of life by having just this minimum guaranteed floor. Okay. So let's slow down. As I understand it, it's 20 years. That's that cliff, right? So for the military pension, like you said, it's all or nothing. If you've served 19 and a half years, it's nothing. If you get to that 20 years, you, you get there the is some safe harbor, but yeah, for most <laughs> people, right. You, I realized 19 yeah. and a half was a bad, it's so funny. <laughs> you could probably see it in my eyes as that was coming out. I'm like, Oh, this is a yeah. high risk proposition here. Okay. Some safe harbors, but right. Essentially all or nothing. Yeah. But then there is this new or newer system, this blended retirement system, probably outside the scope of what we're doing precisely here today. But can you give like a 30 second high level overview of the interplay between the pension and this new blended retirement system. So ultimately the, what the blended retirement system does is in exchange for a government automatic contribution of 1% into the TSP plus the option to get a 4% match so a 5% total contribution, the pension multiplier was reduced. What does that mean in playing English? So beforehand you would serve 20 years, you get a two and a half percent multiplier per year. So that's a 50% pension of the high three years or the legacy 36 months. Now, under the BRS, that multiplier is reduced from 2.5% to 2%. So you serve 20 years under BRS. Now you're getting a slightly smaller pension, a 40% pension at that 20-year point. But in exchange, right, you get matching contributions along the way. And for all those service members who never reach 20 years, they walk away with something. So like me, right? I left at nine years. I was under the legacy system. I walked away technically with no military benefit for retirement. Understood. So that might be for a military fi 101. Well, maybe we'll record that after this or, or we'll do a, a panel. I think that would be another episode that would be really interesting is, is going back to basics on, yeah. because I mean, I suspect, I don't know actually if there is a choice. I believe when Military Dollar told us originally, there still was a choice. I don't know where we stand today. Yeah. So there was an opt-in period back towards the end of my active duty time. And then after that, everybody who joined is automatically enrolled in BRS. So we're, we're getting to the point where in the future, there's going to be only BRS. Okay. So with that multiplier, we're talking regardless, somewhere between 40 and 50% of, I think you said the, the last three or the highest three. High 36. Yep. Okay. And I suspect there are edge cases, right? Yeah. And so like I just recently did a client scenario where I worked with an E9 who was going to retire at 36 years of service. And I had to get some extensions in order to stay on active duty that long. But, you know, there are senior ranks who can serve much longer. But, you know, the classic case for most people, and in the case of our scenario here that we're going to be running for a Choose FI listener in an upcoming episode, we're looking at a 20-year pension. So that, that's pretty typical. All right. Fair enough. So that's a perfect starting point. So, right, we're talking 40 to 50%. And then you said it is inflation adjusted? Yeah. So every year, Congress will set the level of adjustment that's somewhat related to, you know, how CPI comes out. So it's not always a 100% match. But yes, historically, that's going to be there. And of course, most pensions out there that have gone away, this is because of that high inflation risk that the pensioners have to bear. In this case, we've got the power of the taxpayer behind it. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's uh, somewhat powerful, right? And, and yeah. safe, obviously, like you said, except for maybe that crazy zombie apocalypse style uh, scenario. So we'll, we'll consider this about <laughs> as safe of a pension as you could imagine. You mentioned taxpayer, but let, let's actually talk about taxes. So are these pensions taxed federally and by most or all states? Yeah. So they're going to be federally taxable with some caveats in a minute when we start talking about VA benefits, but a federal pension is going to be federally taxable. The state tax scenario is really state specific. So historically, most states who had a state income tax did tax the military pension. However, more and more states of late have started to reduce how much of a military pension might be taxable, or some of them have even stopped taxing them altogether in a quest to gain retirees moving there. It's the state tax landscape has evolved, especially the last couple of years to almost like attract military retirees. So I think Virginia is a pretty recent example of them over the next several years, starting to phase out the level of taxation of military pensions. Very cool. Okay. So if there is a resource that we can find that maybe lists state by state, I don't know if you have something succinct or if we can dig something up, but we'll, we'll certainly put that in the, in the show notes. I think that would be really helpful. So I guess, before we move on to really specific things, are there any other military 
pension or other benefits that like at a real high level that people just might not consider? Obviously, I think healthcare we'll get into. I think that's that's <laughs> one that people are clearly aware of. But are there any other minor ancillary things? Yeah. So from a financial planner, so I put my CFP hat on here for right now. So when you're looking at building that post financial independence budget, or certainly that post-military retirement budget, when you know that your guaranteed expenses are going to be covered, so think your mortgage if you still have one, your property taxes, your bills, your regular life expenses, ultimately what that means for a lot of retirees is if they want, if it makes sense for them based on their risk tolerance and their scenario, they can have a higher equity allocation in their investment portfolio due to you know having the basics covered, right? So if we go back to, I know you've had episodes in the past with talking about a guardrail-driven approach for portfolio withdrawal strategies. So oftentimes when I'm running a military client through my financial planning software, we can look at sometimes a 70 or 30% equity allocation just as an example, as a starting point for somebody who's going to be FI at military retirement or shortly thereafter because they have so much of it covered through their guaranteed expenses through their pension. Now, this doesn't apply to everybody, but all else being equal, if you have a classic FI person who only has portfolio withdrawals, they're going to need to take potentially less equity risk than somebody who has that pension income. And this would apply to any kind of pension income, but the military pension being, quote unquote, more guaranteed just for the strength of the taxpayer behind it offers an opportunity to do that, which means for a lot of people, they might be able to have a slightly higher withdrawal rate, especially if they're willing to be flexible with their withdrawals and planning for Social Security down the road. Interesting. And, you know, it's funny because I feel like pensions are just, they're so rare in everyday <laughs> life now that that I think people often just get confused with even the starting point. Yeah. So for me, and I think we talked about this with Grumpus Maximus way back in the day when we were talking about the golden albatross and just even like a starting point of, okay, let's say you get a $50,000 pension. People, people don't know what their FI number is when you have a pension. And for me, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but my high level is just really simply, I would say, take your annual expenses and then subtract out this guaranteed pension. So let's say hypothetically, your annual expenses are $70,000 and you're getting a $50,000 pension. I think a lot of people have some confusion, but to me, it's actually really simple. You just subtract, right? So yeah. you have a $20,000 that you need to make up in your annual expenses and you'd calculate your fine number off of that. So you just multiply that 20,000 that's remaining by, let's say, 25 if we're using the standard 4% rule. And we can argue about that. It's, it's irrelevant. But in that case, you have a $500,000 fine number because of that pension. So that's kind of back of the envelope as I consider it. Anything that I missed or that you'd add to that? That's a great way to kind of sum it up when you're building that post-retirement budget, and especially because when you look at where the money is coming from, right? If your must needs pay every month are covered by the pension and, you know, your more discretionary expenses are covered by investment withdrawal, right? If you have to slow down or take a break or adjust for market performance that doesn't reflect that, right? It's not a draconian cut in your lifestyle for most military retirees. Yeah, that's that is incredible. So, OK, we've laid the groundwork here. Now let's move on to maybe some of the the more interesting things like we talked about in passing healthcare, And I think it's called TRICARE, right? Yeah, TRICARE, and there's a variety of flavors of that. But for most people, again, CFP hat on, right? When I look at a military retiree's plan approaching financial independence versus one who doesn't, this is honestly one of the biggest things that stands out in the future unknowns. Now, Congress has changed how much retirees are required to pay into TRICARE, but for the most part, again, it's heavily subsidized. So, you know, for a classic retiree kind of scenario, married couple, you know, you might be looking at most out of pocket in a year between 2400 to 3600 under most tricare scenario planning like that. So what that means is over your lifetime, especially for military retirees approaching FI in their say 40s or 50s, right? That is decades of lower costs even before Medicare that the traditional populace is going to have. So what does that mean? You can potentially plan less, spending less in retirement. The, the trade-off is, you know, you got some things like no HSA, no access to that where you're going. So <laughs> it's a trade-off I would take, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's very interesting. Is there any interplay between the ACA and TRICARE? So I'm thinking about like the really kind of advanced FI. So if your taxable income is low enough, there's a world where under the ACA, you're paying virtually zero. Yes. I do that planning often with my widowed clients who don't have a pension or anything like that. Yeah. will artificially keep their 
AGI, adjusted gross income, low in order to qualify for the maximum amount of subsidy. So yes, it was like, if you're an active duty military retiree, you're going to have TRICARE and then later on TRICARE for life when you get to Medicare age. So that ACA plans just don't come into play at all. Gotcha. Okay. Sounds good. That makes sense. So anything else anyone needs to understand or consider, again, with the high level on TRICARE? Uh, just for most people, right? So long-term care, most expenses for the care of activities of daily living, those things are not going to be covered under most TRICARE type scenarios, just like Medicare, just like most traditional health insurance. So for military retirees, right, especially those who are dealing with maybe more health issues or things related to their military service, is going to lead directly into what we're going to talk about related to their VA conditions and making sure that that's documented because long-term care is is not covered under TRICARE. Okay. Yeah. So actually, let's just jump right into that. So the VA disability, I think yeah. that's a, a perfect launching point for that. There are so many benefits that the VA, the Veterans Affairs offers. This is probably one of the most underutilized, at least from just an average person who gets out of the military, especially if they maybe didn't pay attention and tap. That's the transition class before they're getting out, or in many cases have some misconceptions. So I just want to pause here at the beginning. I've heard from so many veterans and people who have served like, well, that, that's not for me, or I'm not broken, or I don't want to take that away from someone who is really deserving. It really just comes down to, one, that's not the way the VA budget works. It's enough to provide for everyone who served. And it goes back to the idea of what were you like before you entered the service? So it's kind of like the they bought the new car. Yeah. <laughs> it got some dings while it was in service. And now at the end, this is just the representation of the compensation and the documentation related to your military service there. So I just strongly encourage everybody, Maybe you've had some misconceptions or maybe just some different opinions, right? Talk to lots of other people. Go talk to people at the VA. Talk to these VSOs, these veteran service organizations. Understand the benefits that you've earned as a part of your service. Now, this relates to the timing because the timing here starts to become pretty critical for those approaching military retirement and, and on a path to FI because of how we want to sequence the VA process, what they call the Benefits Disability Decision at Discharge, the BDD process with other needs. We're going to talk about survivor benefit plan decision in a minute and potentially life insurance underwriting. So the sequence for this gets a little important here because once you start going down the VA road, making sure that your medical conditions are documented appropriately while you're still on active duty, that may in turn impact your ability to get better life insurance rates or underwriting classes. Okay. So if we're thinking of somebody's approaching military retirement, say in the next three to five years, the first thing that we would want to potentially do is evaluate your need for life insurance. So while you're on active duty, you've got access to SGLI, the Servicemen's Group Life Insurance. That's a $500,000 policy now. It's subsidized pretty cheap. And then there's an extra 100000 death gratuity. When you get out, right, that goes away. So that's think of that as group life. You leave active duty, boom. And you have the opportunity to convert that to VGLI, the Veterans Group Life Insurance, but the rates are way higher. <laughs> so if there's a need for life insurance, most term life for most people, right? It's best to go through the underwriting, apply with uh, you know a life insurance broker who can shop around best companies and find that before we start going and getting rid of all your medical records. Okay. So before you get all this stuff documented, that's what you're saying, right? <laughs> well, you have to see, Brad, there's a <laughs> lot of people in the military, um, <clears throat> I may know one of them, <laughs> who maybe didn't tell the doctor everything over the course of their military service because of reasons X, Y, Z, right? Not you know, to get taken out of the line, just misconceptions, or just in general, right? You're pressing ahead. There's a mission to do, job to get done, right? So many, many, <laughs> I dare say not say all, but most military members are not necessarily getting everything documented in their records over the course of their early service. And so as you approach military retirement, maybe you've got that back pain or that issue going on with your hearing or something like that. It's making sure the time that, because it's a, if it's not documented, if you never go see a military medical provider while you're in service and you get to the VA benefits decision, there's nothing to base it on. Okay. All right. So there's, there's some interplay here and, and, and we're going to dial into this, right? So there's the VA disability, but then we're also talking about this term life insurance. So I just want to make sure that I understand and it's clear. Yeah, two and then, separate processes that you're going to do. They're not related necessarily. Okay. So just let's talk about the term life just really quickly before we, we get back to the, the disability. So first, like we always say, this is about taking action, right? That's why yes. Choose If I Exist. So you said something about $500,000 term life while on active duty. Is that something you have to opt into? Is that something that people might be unaware of? I know you said it's very, <laughs> very inexpensive, but is that, do they have to make an action? 
So if you weren't enrolled in it, it's probably because you disenrolled. So everyone's auto enrolled ah. when they join the service or when an increase. So uh, last year, an increase went up. It was four hundred thousand. Went up to five hundred thousand. Everybody was re-increased to it automatically. You had to go in and tell them, "I don't want it" or "want it less." Okay, awesome. So most likely, most people listening to this, if they're on the path to five, they have not <laughs> explicitly opted out of something that's <laughs> pennies and and could give a significant yeah. benefit. But now, life insurance after the military. Is that another opt-in? Yeah, because this is going to relate to the survivor benefit decision, which we're going to talk about here in just a minute. So that military pension, right? How do you protect your spouse and your children if something happens to you? And these are interrelated. So we're going to bounce around a little bit back and forth. But yeah, so if you are going to be leaving the service and you're going to be approaching your FI, whether now or later on with that maybe second act career, it's likely that your family is dependent upon you you, the service member, to stay alive in order to collect that pension, right? And if your family is going to be depending on you for your income, right, this is where life insurance often comes into play. I know the other guests have talked about this, and it's just, you know, protect your family. I work with widows. I'm a widower myself, right? I've been through this. I talked to way too many people who did not have enough life insurance or who approached the military retirement decision, didn't make the maybe the best decision related to SPV, the survivor benefit plan, and now their spouse is the one that's paying for that maybe not great decision. Yeah, this is incredibly important. And certainly term life insurance is critically important for, I think, for pretty much everyone on the path to FI. Obviously, we're talking about military here today, but taking a step back, when we talk about insurance, when we talk about life insurance, we almost, oh, I can't envision a scenario. I suspect there are some edge cases, but essentially term life insurance is pure insurance. And it is easy to understand. It's a simple contract. I think I have a five hundred thousand or seven hundred thousand dollar death benefit, and it's only a couple hundred dollars a year. And I got it in my, I think, late twenties, early thirties when my kids were born. And it was just, it provided a peace of mind that was really phenomenal for just, like I said, really pennies, just a couple hundred bucks a year. So I think that's something that really everyone should consider, especially like you're talking about if. If you are the one who's providing financial support for <laughs> significant other, family, et cetera, I mean, it's one of those kind of almost no-brainer type decisions. So yeah, I'm, I'm really glad we're talking about this. So, okay, I think I did jump ahead a little bit to survivor benefit plan, but is there anything else with the disability consideration that, that we should talk about? Yeah, so get the life insurance underwritten done. Then those last maybe one, two, or three years, if you have not been very good at getting things documented in your medical records, just make sure that it is. And that leads to the process of benefits that you can get. So I won't go through all of them. There's a long list of them on the VA website, va.gov. But the biggest one for military FI planning is the threshold of a greater than 50% rating or less than a 50% rating. So we talked earlier about the military pension being federally taxable. If you go through the process and say you get awarded a 30% or a 40% rating, um, we call it VMAS. It's funny how, how they get there, but either way. Okay. So you go through the whole process, they evaluate your medical conditions and they say you have this number, 30%, 40%, et cetera. And that rating is a disability rating, correct? Yes. Now, that does not mean you can't go get a second job. It has no bearing on your ability to be employed later on, unless we're talking about some very specific pieces of 100% total and permanent rating beyond the scope of this conversation. But yep. for most people, right, you're going to get a rating related to hearing loss and your knee pain and that back injury, or in the case of many of the people who have been overseas in the global war on terror, right, the PACT Act was recently passed, which provides exposure for burn pits and things like that, that just really streamline what was oftentimes a, a confusing process. So if you have a pension, right, you've got that taxable. So you get a 30 or 40% rating, for example, that means a portion of, so the VA would normally pay you several hundred dollars a month related to that rating. Now that portion of it is going to be tax-free. So say, simple math, your pension is 3000 a month and you get a VA rating and that VA rating is going to pay you 1000 a month. That means 2000 of your 3000 pension will be taxable and 1000 would be not relative to your VA rating. Does that make sense, Brad? It does. It does make sense. So the VA rating in this disability, or at least this portion of the explanation is you're not getting additional money. Correct. It's just that a portion of that is then, it, that rating is ultimately what is tax-free. Right. Okay. And so when you get to, there's some concurrent receipt and combat pay specifics, but once you get above that 50% rating, now that portion is additive. Okay. 
So you will have your military pension, back to our example, 3000 a month, and now you will get an additional few thousand a month on top of that, okay? And the VA payments are tax-free. So always, always, you don't, you don't get any 1099 at the end of the year or anything like that. So 50% is the magic number for that? Yeah. Okay. So just for example, so right now, say you're married and you had one kid under 18, so one dependent that way. If you got a 60% rating today, 2024, that would be $1,578 a month. Gotcha. So that's significant. That's quite significant and completely tax-free. Okay. Yeah. Now, for those that get a much higher rating, so that 100% VA rating that is then designated as total and permanent, this opens up some extra educational benefits called the VA Chapter 35 or the Dependents Educational Assistance Program, the DEA. So this would allow your children to be enrolled in this and your spouse. Right now, it's based on academic school year. So if they're in full-time students, as well as apprenticeship programs, in fact, that will pay $1,488 for each full month, so each calendar week of a month that they're enrolled, which is pretty significant. So that, along with things like the GI Bill, which many people do a lot of great planning around for their children, means that unlock a ton of extra education funding for later on, which all plays into the five journey, which means potentially you need to fund less towards those goals if they're otherwise part of your family financial plan. Yeah. So Daniel, like you said, that is really quite considerable. And yeah, there are additional benefits. I think maybe we'll put a note for educational benefits and GI Bill back in the military 101 episode that we'll do. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got a good guest idea for you on that topic, who's an nice. expert in all things GI Bill and education funding. Wonderful. That sounds like, yeah, really good episode, a really good segment. So, okay, let's keep moving on because I think there's more with us. So if you have a VA rating, you're also eligible for medical care from the VA. And in fact, all service members who served at some point in a combat deployment have access to free medical care for five years following their date of separation, not retirement. So now we're talking about somebody who, like me, left at nine years, has the ability to get full medical care. My experience with the VA has been very good. I know that there's some uh, other people's experiences out there, but overall, people that I've talked to and things like that, it's pretty good. You have to be responsible for your own care. Like You can't wait around for them to do everything for you, but um, leveraging that has been a help to me and, and many other people. There's also a host of jobs training and education funding. Something I recently came across helping a client plan for is federal student loan forgiveness as well for those who have that 100% total and permanent rating. There is so much to know about the Veterans Affairs programs. I am just scratching the surface here. So this is where you really need to get connected with that VSO, that Veterans Service Organization, an accredited one, ideally, that can help you sort through these benefits, especially related to your local community. So go uh, Google like accredited VSO and bring up the VA website. You can look through those. But be careful. There's a lot of organizations out there that I hope they mean well, but sometimes they're attempting to work with VA benefits and, and they'll charge a fee. That's not necessarily inherently bad, but most of these VSO organizations out there will be able to do all this help for you for free. So just understand that. Yeah, that is that is wonderful. And now just taking a step back, I think something really important that you said earlier was, quote, you've earned this as part of your service. And I think yeah. a lot of people, like you said, feel a lot of squeamish, let's say maybe, or they, they just, they feel like it's not something that that they've earned or that they deserve or some such, or like you said, it's for somebody else. But I think- really hitting on your words, earned as part of your service. And like you said, you have to get this documented. So that's the critical part. But I, I want to ask about, is there any downside? Because I think we need to always look at yeah. all sides. Like, are there any considerations? So it sounds like this is almost a universal good. Get this documented, you've earned it. But that said, are there any reasons or anything to consider that if you get 100% that it might lead to certain ramifications or like, are there issues potentially, or is that like a total non-starter basically? The only one that I've come across in my planning practice is what I referenced earlier, right? So trying to get potentially life insurance underwritten, you may, or disability insurance, maybe even on the other side, right? You may have impacted your ability to get maybe more preferred rates or maybe even a policy issued based on what is documented. So the sequence of that is just kind of what's important. Got it. Okay. And then, right, just to dial in one last time on that, because again, everyone needs these precise little <laughs> details. So the sequence, so you're getting ready to leave. Let's say it's it's a couple years before this 20. Yep. Can you, at that point, lock in your term life insurance for after military service? That's the sequence, right? Yeah. So 
generally I like to say no later than three years out from military retirement, you want to have done a life insurance needs analysis, whether it's yourself or with a, a great financial planner who can help with that. And then knowing what your needs are, that determines what you're going to do for SBB, which we're about to talk about, so survivor benefit plan. Then during those last few years, so you make a decision based on underwriting. And maybe you get a great class, a great rate, right? Let's lock in that term policy, yeah. maybe even for 30 year years or, or more, right? And then you can go into the VA process, get your medical stuff documented, ready to go. So the challenge comes when people try to squeeze all this into like <laughs> six months, which ugh, not ideal. Okay. You would need to give yourself plenty of time to let life insurance do their thing, medical records, but also the VA process too. It's the government. <laughs> super fast. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I hear you. So I love that. That timeline is really important. So I think clearly the next step, and you've alluded to this, is this SBP, Survivor Benefit Plan. And this is a, a massive decision. Yeah. Let's just make sure we're setting the stage here. Okay. So that pension, right? Say you're that 20-year E7, right? You approach military retirement. Maybe you're retiring for the military at like 39 or 40 years old, right? That government is going to pay you that stream of income for the rest of your life and based on your SPV decision for your dependents as well. That is worth, that net present value, if we calculate some math here, is worth more than $900,000 right there. Not that the federal government would, but if they came and said, here, thanks for your service. Here's a check for you know X. Unless it was way more than $900,000, <laughs> you would be like, forget it, right? Yeah. Now, you can't go buy an inflation-adjusted single premium immediate annuity, like a guaranteed check from an insurance company that will show up every month, every year for the rest of your life, plus inflation. So there's just, it's probably worth even more than that. But, you know, and then that on the officer side, so for like an 05, a lieutenant colonel or person in that rank at 20 year retirement, it's worth about $1.9 million. So I'm not overstating this when I say for most military service members, the SPB decision is literally the biggest financial decision they will make their entire life, bar none. So it's critical to get it right. Yeah, pretty important. And that's quite a setup. So, all right. What is this decision? How does someone even approach from a high level? Well, don't listen to the rumors. I guess I would start there. <laughs> like many things in personal finance, this one seems to be more filled with misinformation than most. So obviously, you're going to have to do your own research. But again, let me pause here. If you're listening to this podcast, my suspicion is that you are the financial person in your marriage or relationship, right? So if you are the one listening to this and your spouse or your partner is not, why don't you just go home and ask them a question? Hey, honey, what's SPB? <laughs> Have you ever heard of this thing called the Survivor Benefit Plan, right? And if their answer is a blank stare, okay, well, then you're going to need to bring them along on this education journey too, because legally, they are the ones making this decision. They are the ones who ultimately have to sign the form, okay? Much like other parts of our country, this is governed under ERISA, the Employee Retirement Securities Act, and it relates to this spouse is going to have to sign off if you're going to take anything less than full SPB. All right. So bring them along this journey. Maybe have them listen to this podcast. I recently did another podcast talking about this in a bit more detail with Jamie and Spencer over in the Military Money Manual podcast. We can have that in the show notes as well. Yeah, for sure. But don't do this decision alone because they have to make the decision, right? So don't pressure them. Don't make them do it. So let's start there. What is SPB, right? This is a pension protection plan. It's going to pay your spouse if something happens to you. So if you're the military retiree and you live well into your 80s, 90s, 100s and beyond, great. You're going to keep collecting that check. But what happens if something happens to you before then, right? Well, if you don't choose SPB, the pension stops. It's done. So if you elect into SPB, which, by the way, is the default choice, that is the default option you have to opt out, then your spouse will be paid 55% of what you did, okay? Now, that doesn't come for free. So we can talk about the costs and the pros and the cons, but that's the simplest thing, right? Protecting your spouse and or potentially your children with a lifetime guaranteed check for them for the rest of their lives as well. Okay. So you said 55%, did I hear that right? Yes. So 55% of the pension benefit that they were already getting. Correct. Okay. So the retired military member, as we talked about, they get their pension based on a multiplier, which most likely is somewhere between 40 and 50%, depending. So they get their pension every month for the remainder of their lifetime, right? So they get that full amount for the remainder of their lifetime. Like you said, it's inflation adjusted. Now, SBP is automatic, so you don't have to opt into it, but we'll dive into that a little bit more. But assuming that SBP is active, when the retired military member passes away, then 
you basically take that monthly amount that they were getting in their pension and multiply it by 0.55. Is that high level how we're approaching this? Yes. Yeah, so that's right. Okay. Got it. Now, my natural question is, this is automatic. So therefore, I wouldn't assume that it would reduce anything being the uh, the actual monthly pension. But that is, uh, you, you know what happens when you make an assumption, right? <laughs> so who's paying for that, Brad? Is yep, the question, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So this is where it comes into, and I hear this question all the time, is SPB worth it? Is SPB expensive? Should I take it? That seems like a lot of money, right? So let's talk about what it costs. So if you opt into the full SPB, then you will pay 6.5% of your monthly pension check as the premium, okay? So let's look at a recent client example that I had for an 05 at 20-year pension. So she was going to be getting $5,083 a month for her monthly pension check. So her monthly SPB coverage was going to cost $330.45. All right, so that was for spouse and children. We'll break down that in a second, but the majority of that cost in this case, $330.45 or 40 cents was uh, the spousal cost, five cents a month was the child cost. So <laughs> big difference in cost here, right? So, and that would entitle the spouse to collect, in this case, 55% of the premium or the pension, which was $2,795 a month, right? So that's a lot of money, right? Now you're going to pay this SPB premium if you opt in for 30 years. <laughs> so back to how much is this a decision? Is this expensive? Well, in comparison to what, right? What would happen if you died and your spouse got nothing? I'd say that's pretty expensive, right? At the same time, 30 years of payments. So this 05 is probably going to be paying around $120,000, $130,000. And that E7 30 years of uh, example I gave earlier is probably going to be paying about sixty to seventy thousand dollars over that time period. You know that's real money. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's look at the other question: Is it expensive? Well, compared to what? It is cheaper than similar FERS. So if you're a federal employee and you're in the FERS system, you have a, a somewhat similar calculation. It's more. It costs more over there. So actually, on the DoD side, the DoD is subsidizing this cost. So that six and a half percent, you're not paying the full cost. All right. The federal government is actually subsidizing a portion of it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that seems, uh, to me, it seems fairly reasonable, especially because if this is what your family is relying on, and maybe, maybe you haven't saved as much for FI because you have this pension coming in, this is guaranteed because life is not guaranteed, right? As, as you know, with certainly personal experience and, and the people you work with, I mean, things happen, right? Yeah. And very unexpected things happen, certainly. And you might be planning on 50 years of a pension, but what happens if you get hit by the proverbial bus two years in, right? Like the money stops at that point. How do you not had SBP? Yeah. Now, fortunately, you don't have to make this decision alone. There are some tools out there. One is actually one of the best ones is provided by the DOD Office of the Actuary. Now, the first reaction oftentimes when I get that is, what? There's an office of the actuary for the DOD? <laughs> yes, they do a lot of great work. But one of the things they do is they provide some Excel calculators that they populate every year with real world data from real retirees based on life expectancy and longevity and things like that. And so you can go and put in your information, your demographics, your spouse, your family, things like that. So let's talk through the pros and cons because there's a lot to consider with this decision. Obviously, the pro of sticking with SPB is that, again, that same guaranteed monthly payout for the lifetime of your beneficiary, generally the spouse, index for inflation. It's that longevity insurance. You know, We don't talk about that as much as I probably think we should in the FI community, which is what happens if you live a really long time, or in the case of you're the one with the pension, what happens if your spouse without the pension lives for a really long time without you, right? Especially as we continue to live longer and longer. Um, it's predictable. It's easy. It's automatic covered with no medical or eligibility requirements. So maybe you've had some health challenges, especially over the course of your military career. There's no underwriting. It's automatic. You get it. Boom. Once in paid up status. So after those 30 years, it is done, which is 360 month of premium and reaching age 70. So I, I didn't mention that caveat earlier. So in the case of like a younger enlisted retiree who say maybe you're retiring at 38 or 39, they might pay a little bit more because they've not yet reached that age 70 mark there. But once they reach that, boom, it's done. So even if you're, say, living well into your early 80s, and then your spouse lives well into, say, their early 90s, right? That still may be worth it at that stage of time. It's much cheaper than, like I said, the first cost. 
and the payments are made from pre-tax income. So it does reduce your federal income tax liability the way it's actually paid out. Okay. So generally when I'm working with people, it comes down to this is not just a math decision. This is a swan decision that sleep well at night. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And that is uh, that is critically important, right? I, it's funny because I was going to ask you like, oh, is there a break-even calculation? But I mean, frankly, it's beside the point. I think the sleep well at night test is really what you're purchasing here. And let me emphasize, that's the sleep well at night, not for you, but right. for your spouse, not you, the financial person, right? It is the other person in your relationship. Yeah. Just a, a little uh, sidebar on this. So this premium amount paid, like, is it something you have to actually cut a check for it? Is it just net out of your pension benefit every it's month? It's automatically taken out of your monthly check. Yep. Your retirement check. And is that 6.5% of that current check or is it by some freak chance guaranteed locked in that nope. first day? When your pension goes up for inflation, your SPV premium <laughs> goes up with that as well. So it's not the first year, it's the every year. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And then, yeah, just doing back of the envelope math and thinking like, I, I was trying to figure out that 30 years. So, right. Let's say hypothetically, an officer who went to RTC or a service academy, they get out at about 22. They've worked for 20 years. So they're 42. That's why the 30 years, they'll be 72 at that point. Whereas you said, yeah. there are some edge cases for young enlisted, somebody enlisted at 18, 19. Yes, yes, exactly. Right? So they'd have to probably pay for 32 years. But I mean, that's so almost irrelevant. It's just you're essentially paying for 30 years. Yeah. So that's some of the major considerations here. Now, in one of those DOD Office of the Actuary Calculators, you'll input your information and your spouse's information, right? So this is when we start to look at things like, well, <laughs> actuarial tables, like men in our country, on average, tend to live less years than women. Okay. So if we look at an average military retiree, more often than not, it's a man married to a woman, right? And so when you're looking at that, especially if there's age differences, so I did recently a client plan where the male military retiree was married to a, his spouse, his wife was about 12 years younger than him. Now we're starting to look at some major demographical differences, holding all else equal family history and life expectancy and health and all that kind of stuff. It is likely that she is going to outlive him. Now back to the widow side. So I work with a nonprofit, Modern Widows Club. They've done some research. Right now, the average age for widowhood in the United States is 59. Wow. So let me let that sink in. The average age is 59. So when you're thinking about like, what is this going to look like for your spouse? Wow, that could be a long time. So you can input this data into the actuarial calculator based on your age, genders of your spouse and you, and it will tell you if you elect SPB with real world data for demographic data, the probability that your spouse will outlive you by one month, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. So I did it recently for a client, the husband and wife were the same age. There was a 24% chance that she was going to outlive him by at least five years. So if you're thinking about running break even, right, that can start to help you do that. But again, that's not really what this is about. It can help you analyze a variety of things, but just think about it. So in a scenario where, say, you're the same age or maybe in a same sex couple, you start to look at things a little bit differently. Or in the case of, say, maybe the military retiree is much younger than an older non-retired spouse, now this starts to really play into the other factors. But all else being equal, the default choice is generally best for what's been the classic case, male military retiree married to a younger female spouse. So most people benefit from opting into that. So if you start to stray away from that scenario and have age differences or things like that, now it starts to get a little more complicated. My mind immediately goes to something like contingent beneficiaries, like on a, mm -hmm. on a, a normal, let's say, hey, I have my primary beneficiary on my 401k and then contingent. Let's just say hypothetically, the beneficiary predeceases the military retiree. And I mean, I guess I have a couple of questions. If you're still within that 30-year period, do you stop paying the 6.5% if there are no contingent beneficiaries? So like my, the questions actually <laughs> tie together here, right? Like, is it conceivable yeah. if your significant other spouse predeceases you that you can give the benefit to somebody else? Or is it just a simple contract that is the person? And if they do die before you, then there's no no additional benefit. Yeah, you're really pulling out the edge cases today, <laughs> Brad. So in that scenario, the SPV would be able to be stopped because you're not married anymore. Exceptions would be like if you had a prior spouse, an ex-spouse who in a divorce decree, there was some allocation related to SPV. But another classic scenario is you leave the military, retire, and you're not married. And then sometime later on, you do get married. 
there's an opt-in window that you have to go and enroll in SBB and start paying premiums to protect your spouse. But if you are married at the time of service, you know, and you make an option, it only can change based on a marital status change later on. The other thing is like, so it's a one-time decision. So you make this, it's an irrevocable decision. There have been a few open seasons where Congress has come back and changed the program. One just ended last year. That was because of some very specific changes related to the dependency indemnity compensation offset, which is beyond the scope of this conversation. <laughs> but short version is before you weren't able to get both SPB and DAC, now you can. Okay. So Congress went and changed the rules and then allowed people to opt back in if they had previously opted out. In my professional opinion, I don't think Congress will do that because there's nothing left to change. So in other words, once you make this SPB decision, it is final. There is one small window of opportunity between the 24th and the 36 months between year two and three where you opted in and then you change your mind. You don't get back any of the premiums you paid, but you can quit the program at that point in time. Okay. All right. So you need to make that decision then by that 36 month. Okay. So I guess my question about contingent beneficiaries, it sounds like there are none, but are there considerations for children in any way? Yeah. So if you have minor children when you're opting into SVB, then they're covered. So I just gave that example a moment ago where the child coverage was ridiculously cheap. So rule of thumb, always, 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 always opt for child coverage because it's so cheap. All right. And because it covers them. One of the best parts of choosing child coverage, whether you choose child only or child coverage, you definitely want to include your children is because also if something happens to them where they place into a status of secondary dependency. So think of this as a child who maybe is never going to be fully independent. There's a whole DOD process to do that where they can also get access to TRICARE and things like that for the rest of their life. Think like a special needs kind of planning scenario. So in that kind of case, now if something happens to you and an adult child is in a secondary dependency status, now they get to collect that SBB check for the rest of their lifetime. Wow. So always, 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 always opt for child SBB. And now unlike SBP, which is automatic, you have to opt out. You have to opt in to the child? When you're making the decision which kind to get spouse is automatic, child, you're choosing to enroll them as well. Okay. So, right. It's because it's so inexpensive. It's hard for me to envision a scenario where you would not do that, essentially. Like you're saying, always, 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 right? <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So let me pull up another scenario that I did recently for an E6 who was retiring at 22 years. So they had four children at the time. He was going to pay $7 a month for child-only coverage. So he didn't cover his spouse. Okay. I cannot emphasize enough right. it's essentially how inexpensive free. it is relative to the payoff and the opportunity. Now, if there are ordinary children, right, getting off into life on the graduating on their own, then for most of them, it's going to stop at either 18 or in full-time student status a little bit longer than that. So just from that standpoint, it's not a forever benefit from them unless they are in a secondary dependency status. Okay. Okay. And Daniel, I'm curious, are there other resources that someone could consider, podcasts or blogs or anything from the, the DOD itself? Yeah. So we talked about the DOD Office of the Actuary Calculators. A colleague of mine, Forrest Baumover, wrote a book several years ago. You can buy it on Kindle, Military and Transitions Guide to the Survivor Benefit Plan. So again, a fellow CFP just walking through all the financial planning considerations that we talked about in more detail. It's a great starting point. Another friend of mine, Kate Horrell, she's got probably one of the most extensive blog collections about articles about SPB. So we can link to that in the show notes. And again, like going through the TAP class, the transition program, many people have found that that is helpful. And then again, bringing your non-financial spouse alongside this decision to help make it together. And that transition class, the TAP class, is that something that people are kind of forced to take? Or is that another kind of, hey, you need to look for it? I don't actually know all the service rules if they require it, absolutely, but it is certainly offered and encouraged across everyone, and, and especially those approaching military retirement, you can take it multiple times as well. Okay, awesome. So that's something, again, action steps for everybody listening, look out for that. It's important. Daniel's recommending it. It's a free resource. It's there. Just take advantage of it. Yeah. All right, Daniel. So I think we pretty much covered that. Where do we move from here? Are there any other considerations you want to talk about today? Well, these are the big ones, right? SBB, I mean, that's the get it right or potentially your entire financial independence journey is thrown off. Yeah. But there's a few others along the way, right? Which is, I know Doug Norderman talked about this back in his episode, which is basically, you know, maybe you're approaching military retirement and it sounds so great, but the whole idea, Grumpus Machimus covered this as well, right? It's just 
too far. So maybe you're at that 15 year point and you're like, oh, it's so close, but it also looks so hard. And maybe this is where you step back and you evaluate that reserve career, right? It's still a great path to financial independence, still have the ability to earn a pension. It just starts later uh, at age 60 for most scenarios. And then you still have access to TRICARE, just a slightly different version of TRICARE reserve select. Having worked with a lot of clients who left active duty, especially those with dual military careers, and one spouse is often having to make the decision about, do we both keep doing this or want to step back? I've seen firsthand the way the quality of life can improve when making that decision. Not something to be done lightly, especially as you're closer to retirement, but it still can be a powerful tool along the path to five. So for reservists, how does a pension work for them? Is that something that's worth talking about? I guess just real high level, is the 20-year pension only for active duty or is there a way to get a pension if you're in the reserves? There's one special category called AGR or Active Guard Reserve, which is very, very similar to military service of active duty, but you're in a guard unit. Those positions are hard to come by. <laughs> okay. I have some friends who have done that. So yes, you still can get the 20 year. But what I'm talking about here is more of a traditional reserve. So this is the one weekend a month, two weeks a year drilling status. And somebody who's in that position, they're going to vest under a points-based system but not start immediately upon separation of military service. Gotcha. All right, Daniel. So I I think going down this incredible set of bullet points that you sent me, I think we're pretty much getting ready to wrap up. There's one last section. So it's on tax planning. Now, we talked a little bit about taxation, just very much in passing about taxation of pensions and potential states. But I want to throw it to you for when people approach you about, about tax planning and military retirement, where do you start? Oh, taxes are probably one of my absolute favorite pieces of financial planning. I'm a nerd. I love the tax code, <laughs> you know, or at least understanding it to help clients, right? So we've talked a little bit about the way VA offset and integration with the disability work with pension. The biggest question I often get, though, is like, okay, I'm now going on to my second act career post-military retirement. I'm collecting this pension. Now I've got this W-2 job or, or self-employment or something like that. Why am I getting killed in taxes now? It's like, Well, you know, that was all the tax-free allowances you were used to getting, the housing allowance, the substance allowance, you know, combat pay when you're uh, deployed, setting aside your taxation of your regular basic pay. All these things can often create a distorted sense of tax reality until you get to the other side. So I'd say it's probably the number one, number two most frequent question I get is like, why am I getting killed in taxes after military retirement? Well, Oftentimes, you're now in a higher tax bracket, and certainly your effective rate, your average tax rate across all your compensation is much higher. So that's just, that's often the way it is. So rerunning some of those analysis or getting help from a qualified tax professional can help, especially in that first year post-military retirement. Now, how does that relate while you're still on the path? So you're still in that three to five years, right? Recognizing that, especially if you're planning on working in a career post-military, more likely than not, right? The average is that you're going to be paying more taxes then. So if you're still in your savings, probably not a huge surprise, especially while we're still under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act here in 2024 and 2025, the average scenario is more Roth now, right? So Roth TSP has been a great option for several years, Roth IRA, backdoor Roth, things like that, to analyze, you know, now versus future tax-free income. And maybe even, I've had some recent scenarios where it might even make sense to do Roth conversions now while you're still on active duty to potentially use up the bottom of, say, the 12 or the 22% bracket to optimize compared to where you might be down the road and just give you. And the last piece is probably one that I think most people are aware of, but just in case they're not, the Section 121 Home Sale of Capital Gains Exclusion. So, right, those of you familiar with the real estate planning, that 24 months in the prior 60 months, getting to exclude either 250 or 500,000 of your primary residence, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> The military has the ability to extend that window by an additional 10 years with the appropriate paperwork. So if you have accumulated houses over the course of your military career, right, we often refer to those as accidental landlords. <laughs> as you are approaching military retirement, recognize the ticking clock is approaching that, right? Because that is an extension while you are on active duty. So I'm helping a client right now where they're about four years out from military retirement, and we are starting to sell some of those homes in order to still take advantage of the Section 121 sequence, but yet not stack them all up right away when they leave active duty. So something to be aware of there. Taxes are a key piece of financial plan and especially those in the five community, right? Recognizing now versus future. So that's the key. Looking at where you're at today, while you're still in active duty, before where you'll be in a post-career and or uh, just general FI timeline when you're withdrawing from your portfolio. 
Yeah, I love that. So right, everyone's situation is different. I think that's that's one of the cool parts about the Phi community is we survey the scene and the world as it is, right? These are the rules, not how we want it to be, but these are the rules. And like you're saying, many people who are military retirees might bemoan, oh, I'm paying so much more in tax. But somebody who's hearing you talk about this is saying now, oh, that's interesting. So my current benefits and my current pay just before I get to retirement I'm getting maybe some of these tax-free allowances. Maybe I'm down in that 12% bracket. So instead of putting into a traditional retirement account and getting the guaranteed tax savings then, but if you're only at the 12% bracket, you might say, oh, Roth, right? That's what I'm hearing from you. That's just such a cool rethink on this of, all right, you have to understand the practical realities. And in this case, there's a reasonable chance that a Roth contribution makes more sense because of those tax-free allowances. And I guess the further extension, I'm thinking of just somebody who's on the path to FI, they're getting this military retirement. Hey, maybe they're coming out. They don't need that second act. There are a lot of people, right, in the FI community who, (laughs) hey, if you're getting a, you're maybe in 05 or 06, you're getting a 50, 60, $70,000 pension, or who knows, it might be slightly more. And that might be enough. Right. Like, and you talk, Hey, we, we spent this whole time talking about somebody who has a spouse. You're getting the standard deduction. I mean, your tax liability, your taxable (laughs) income could be really, really low. Like you might come out and say, damn, I'm paying virtually nothing. This is a bonanza. Yeah. I mean, I'd say across a lot of my clients, the average tax rate, the effective tax rate for so many people on active duty is single digits, even, especially when you factor in child tax credits for a lot of these families. Now, the switch off and flip. So post-military career, and now you're, say, earning you know, good income in that post-military job plus salary. And maybe your spouse is now earning income, too, based on age or stage of kids. It often happens. I see that happen regularly. Now, the script might flip. So now you might be switching to saving if you're still in that and not a coast-fire scenario where you're, now you're doing traditional savings post-military service. So something to keep in mind there. Yeah. No, indeed. Daniel, this has been amazing. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so very much for coming on. Thank you for all the care you took and and putting together this outline and and really just explaining it so clearly. I think we've littered throughout the hour plus here, just a series of action steps. And I think we really slowed down on them. For anybody listening, if this is pertinent to you, if this is pertinent to a family member, someone you know, send it to them, but also sit down with a piece of paper and pen and write down all of these action steps that Daniel just so beautifully explained. I think it's this is really important and can make a massive, massive difference. So Daniel, thanks again for coming on. Where can people reach you? Is there, I know obviously I mentioned your financial planning, but uh, where can people find you? Well, uh, my firm is Wise Stewardship Financial Planning. So it's wisestewardshipfp.com. I'm also a founding board member of an organization called the Military Financial Advisors Association, or MFAA. It's a group of all fee-only fiduciary financial planners who are either veterans ourselves or military spouses, and we all specialize in working with some segment of the military population. So we've got somebody who specializes in the unique needs of like the reserve component or those who are more in like the special forces. I work with a lot of dual military spouses as well as gold star widows. We've got something for everybody and that helps do that. So if you're looking for some advice in that standpoint, I'm also pretty active in a lot of these personal finance Facebook groups, including the, there's a group choose FI us military. So happy to help answer questions there. And of course you can find me on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. I also have a podcast called military to financial planner, which is entirely tended. Like if you are thinking about becoming a financial planner, then this is for you. I created this to kind of have conversations at scale that I've been having one-on-one about people who also made the jump. Because I'll tell you, Brad, I mean, nine or 10 years ago, I did not even know that there was such a thing as a CFP. I had no idea that there was the fee-only world. I just thought everybody sold everything on commissions, right? And had the ability to work with clients. So this has tried to help that career process just be a little bit easier for veterans, for military spouses, for anybody who's thinking of going into financial planning as a career. So I encourage you to come check it out. I love it. We're going to put all the resources in the show notes. And Daniel, we're going to do a part two, which is actually going to be a case study on one of our community members who reached out. But I think what I also want to do is throw this open, throw this open to the community. Like I said, it's such a huge percentage of our audience is military, is either current or former military. And this is really, really important. So the best way to send questions in, if you're listening to this, is to get on my newsletter. So just go to chooseavida.com slash subscribe and then literally hit reply to any of the emails that come to you and just send in your questions. And I'm going to 
curate and collate that entire list. And Daniel, we're going to do either one or more follow-ups, a series of follow-ups, because I think this is really, really important. So again, thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thanks. It was a pleasure.